Welcome, Dr. Cordain, to the Water Cooler Hangout. We appreciate you being here today. And I wanted to start by just asking you exactly what is the paleo diet? Well, Bob, it's my pleasure to, to be with you today. And uh, paleo stands for old, and it's really kind of an abbreviation for paleolithic, which means old Stone Age. And the old Stone Age is a period that lasted from uh, when the first stone tools were made roughly two and a half million years ago uh, until 10,000 years ago with the beginning of the agricultural revolution. And so uh, the paleo diet is a diet that tries to emulate with modern foods the types of foods that our Stone Age ancestors would have consumed during that uh, two and a half million year period. And so those kinds of foods from reading your book are basically lean meat, um, protein, of course, lean meat, uh, fish, poultry, um, and also pretty much all the fruits and vegetables that you want. That's right. So uh, you pretty much need to stick to the outside aisles and stay away from uh, processed foods and grains and dairy, sugar, and salted foods. And so... uh, these are the foods that we are genetically adapted to, and uh, our bodies do quite well when we put living foods uh, back into our, our body, uh, the types of foods that uh, our ancestors ate. Well, I actually uh, you know, found you and, and found the diet here a couple of months ago through a colleague of mine in uh, Florida whose wife works at a hospital, and she had heard about the, uh, the diet there. So she suggested to him, because he was having some problems with energy, and um, he casually mentioned it to me one day, and I went ahead and, and bought the book. And on uh, July 12th, I, myself and my wife both started it. Now, I, I should tell you, too, that before this time, um, I pretty much ate what I want. I did do uh, vegetarian for a half a year. Uh, I've tried other types of diets. I've lost lots of weight. And, and frankly, I have lots of weight to lose. So I thought, well, I'm going to give this a try because I'm tired of feeling tired and I'm tired of, of uh, feeling this way. So I, it's a fantastic program. I don't call it a diet uh, anymore. I refer to it as a, a lifestyle way of eating. But since July 12th, uh, besides losing 25 pounds, I've also uh, I have lots of energy. I'm sleeping better. I've weaned myself off of some uh, medicine that I, uh, with my doctor's uh, blessing, and uh, it's it's just a fantastic program. So I want to thank you first. <laughs> for, well, uh, thank you, Bob, for you know the kind words, and uh, you know I think uh, one of the the greatest pleasures I derive is when I hear stories like this. Uh, and believe me, uh, you know I, I've heard these over the last decade or so. So I think that uh, you're absolutely right. I, when I <clears throat> wrote the book uh, way back in 2002. Uh, the slant that my editor at uh, John Wiley and Sons uh, took was to make it a weight loss book, but it was never my intent to do that. My intent was always that this is a lifetime way of eating that helps to normalize our health and our well-being. And uh, it is therapeutic. I think the medical community is increasingly starting to to believe this. Um, and it's not just alternative medicine. I think that uh, you know many physicians in, in many disciplines around the world uh, realize that uh, this is one of the, the healthiest ways to eat. There's, I think, resistance to it uh, by some of the you know standard diet in the world dietitian types uh, who can't get off the idea that uh, cereal grains and dairy may not be uh, <clears throat> less than healthful foods, but. Uh, for the most part, uh, <clears throat> this thing works. My book is selling now uh, in 2010 better than it did in 2002. And I, I think the reason for it is is, is because of the Internet. We've uh, developed this incredible interconnectedness of people, this network of people that correspond and communicate with one another. And just as you mentioned, you found it from a friend. A friend tells another friend. And it has this uh, snowballing effect. And so I think, uh, you know, my book is in the top ten best-selling diet and health books, and here we are a decade after it was published. And I think it's for that very same reason is, is that it works. And when yeah. people find something that works and is, you know, it's not impossible to do and uh, it makes them feel better, uh, they pass it on. And, and that's really the, the, the beauty of this thing is that uh, I didn't, you know, it, it's not dependent upon a charismatic individual or scientist or doctor 
uh, to make this thing run. I, I didn't invent this. What, what I did and what uh, other scientists from around the world did is we simply uncovered what was pre-existing. We uncovered what the pre-existing diet that our species is adapted to, and then all we did was we said, okay, hey, let's make it work with foods that you can get at the supermarket. So that's kind of how the whole thing came about, and uh, it's very gratifying to hear stories like yours and, and literally tens of thousands of others that uh, you know, have a very similar uh, bent. Well, you know, it's a, it was amazing to myself, and again, my colleague Tim Brownson, I should mention his name, uh, we did some uh, talk with other uh, people, just kind of put it out there into uh, the people that follow us and read our blogs and books, and said, do you know anything about this? And we, we got tons of responses from people who, yeah, they've been on it for years, or, you know, they've, they've anywhere from, you know, from the time the book was published up until recently, to a person, none of them had anything negative to say. The only negative comments we got were from people when we probed a little. It turned out they, they hadn't read the book and they hadn't uh, actually tried the diet. So they were just sold on the idea that, and, and this is something I'm sure must frustrate you, that uh, the, you know, the Department of Agriculture in this country still tells people to eat six to 11 daily servings of grain. You know, uh, I, I'm a scientist at a Division One research institution in the United States, and uh, I, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I always let the data speak for itself, and I think that's something different. In many diets or health books and so forth, uh, once again, you get charismatic individuals that tell you to do this or that or whatever, and, you know, we practice what we preach. I go out into the scientific community, and I publish in top-tier scientific journals, in peer-reviewed journals. And so the information that, you know, we gets out in the popular books is directly from the science. And so I, I think that's kind of unusual is that I tow both lines. I'm a, a scientist as well as a you know, person that goes out there and, and uh, writes popular books. But, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is, uh, you know, it's, it's a lifetime way of eating that makes people energized, makes them healthier, and, oh, I, I know what I wanted to say is that the notion of uh, cereal grains. So um, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, which is the uh, highest impact factor nutrition journal in the world, uh, I've published a, a couple of papers, and we were able to show that uh, cereal grains are nutritional lightweights. They have uh, much less, on a calorie-by-calorie -calorie basis, much less vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals than do fruits and vegetables and lean meat and seafood. And so, I, you know, it's just like pointing out that the king isn't wearing clothes. We, we pointed out the obvious, and it's like, why in the world would you make a uh, substance, grains, the basis of your diet when it is, it's, you know, the nutritional lightweight that it is? So uh, I think that when you look at it from that perspective, okay, what, you know, what uh, food type is the most concentrated source of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and whatever, uh, you're looking at the foods that we have always consumed. And so cereal grains in hunter-gatherer societies were considered starvation foods, and they were only consumed when there's nothing else to, to eat. Yeah, I, that was a, uh, you know, I guess I hadn't really thought about that when I read the book, but I'm thinking, you, you know, you're right. Why would they want to eat uh, uh, some piece of, you know, vegetable grain that they, they couldn't really digest anyway for the most part? Well, part of the reasons why they didn't eat it is, is something called optimal foraging theory. And when you're a hunter-gatherer and you have to go out and expend energy to get energy, uh, you try to maximize that. So, they, I mean, they didn't understand that mathematically, but they understood it intuitively, is that when they went out and were foraging for food, the very first thing they were going to go after was a large, big animal because it has the most, the greatest, densest source of calories. And if they can't get that, then they're going to meet, get a medium or a small-sized animal. And plant foods were always um, <clears throat> secondary to animal foods, and, and we were able to demonstrate this in over 220 uh, hunter-gatherer societies. And then when they went out and they, they went after plant foods, they prioritized that too. They went after the plants that had the greatest caloric density, they went after nuts and underground storage roots and uh, sweet fruits and so forth. The problem with cereal grains is <clears throat> that they're very small, they're tiny, they're difficult to harvest, and then once you harvest them, you have to grind them up into a paste, and then you've got to go out and gather up a bunch of wood, build a fire, 
and cook them because cereal grains are indigestible in their raw form. So uh, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to make them usable to eat if you're a hunter-gatherer. Now, when, once agriculture was developed and we started to mechanize the process, uh, that's another story. But uh, really, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, grains have only been part of the human diet for about 330 human generations. Even, and that, that amounts to about 10,000 years, and 10,000 years seems to be historically remote, but uh, it's very recent on an evolutionary time scale. And so grains not only are nutritional lightweights, but they also have uh, what we call anti-nutrients, and these anti-nutrients um, impair our health, and they, it's been known for 30 or 40 years, uh, but apparently the USDA and the other people just kind of turn their head the other way when you talk about these anti-nutrients. <laughs> Which, you know, we won't get into the political ramifications of that. But no, <laughs> that there's no count. need to. But, you know, I think, once again, the data really should speak for itself. And as a scientist or even, even as a layperson, you ought to know what the facts are before you make a decision. Right. Well, um, you also uh, found that there was a problem with legumes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because a lot of people think that, you know, eating beans and, and, and soy and other types of, you know, legumes, I guess, uh, are really good for them. Well, let me put it in a broader perspective. When you look at legumes and you look at grains, cereal grains, um, what these are is these are the seeds of a plant, and they represent the plant's reproductive material. And so, indeed, they can be concentrated sources of nutrients. But the problem is, is when you are a plant, you can't run away from a predator, okay? And so a plant doesn't just make its reproductive materials to feed to a predator, because if that's the case, then the seeds of that plant would be consumed, and the plant wouldn't reproduce, and it would die out and become extinct. So the evolutionary, plant, the evolutionary strategy that legumes and grains have taken uh, to prevent predation is they have evolved what are called anti-nutrients. And these anti-nutrients are toxic to insects and funguses and uh, small pathogens that uh, prey on the plants. And uh, some uh, animals have uh, devised evolutionary strategies to get around these toxicities, uh, but most haven't. And so uh, grains indeed uh, have these toxic compounds, as do legumes. And we can get into the laundry list of them. There's a half dozen or so that adversely affect humans, and we've known this for 40 years. Once again, uh, anybody can look in the scientific literature and see that. So, for instance, let's, what's wrong with uh, legumes? What are the anti-nutrients that we find in legumes? Well, first off, legumes contain a substance called phytate or phytic acid, and it binds up all of the divalent ions, meaning iron and calcium and zinc and so forth, so on paper, grains and legumes may look to be nutritionally dense, but in the body, what we call in vivo, those nutrients aren't available for digestion because they're bound to phytic acid. So that, that's been known for a long, long period of time. So if you do nut computerized nutritional analysis of, of grains and legumes, it looks like, oh, yeah, we've got a good source of zinc and you know, minerals and all these things. Nonsense. Those things cannot be <clears throat> absorbed because they are bound to phytic acid. All right, let's move on to some of the other damaging substances that are in legumes. Um, one of them is a substance called a saponin. And a saponin, as the word kind of implies, is like a soap. It's a soapy substance that uh, legumes have evolved, and it is toxic to predators. And what it does is it does a number of things. It, it um, breaks down membranes. And so uh, when we eat legumes, what happens is our intestinal tract becomes slightly leaky. And that's uh, <clears throat> a good thing for the seed because then what happens is it's got other compounds called lectins, and the lectins, as well as the saponins, can be toxic if they get into our, our blood system. Um, there are another uh, family of substances called protease inhibitors uh, in legumes, and protease inhibitors prevent our digestive tract from breaking down these toxic compounds. And so we've got this whole package of lectins, protease inhibitors, and, and saponins, and uh, when they get into our system, they can <clears throat> be toxic. And one of the things that the saponins do is, that, as I mentioned, they break down membranes. And so they break down the membranes of the gut, and if they can get into uh, systemic circulation, they break down the membranes of our red blood cells, and this causes what's, what's called hemolysis. And um, 
in human in, in humans uh, <clears throat> there have been numerous cases of of legume poisoning from people eating raw beans so the if you if you cook them it tends to break down these anti nutrients but uh, uh, the less you cook them, the, the greater the concentrations. We're also finding that uh, <clears throat> that these substances are involved in autoimmunity. And uh, one of the uh, really sidelights of this whole paleo diet is that people with autoimmune disease uh, seem to respond. When I first wrote the book, I realized I had, I had the knowledge that that legumes and grains potentially um, could be involved with autoimmunity. But uh, now that uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are following the paleo diet, uh, we're getting a good <clears throat> cross-section of the population as a whole. And so many people uh, that adopt the diet with autoimmune disease are doing it for reasons other than autoimmunity, and they find out that it causes their autoimmune disease to improve or go into complete remission. And uh, our group right now at Colorado State University is working on how and why these types of diets, the paleo diet, tends to prevent uh, and uh, help uh, be therapeutic for autoimmune folks. And I understand you've been looking into uh, multiple sclerosis as one of the uh, primary focus points of this. Well, we, we, you know, we, our, our original paper, we wrote a paper in 2002 and published in the British Journal of Nutrition, and the model that we used at the time was rheumatoid arthritis, uh, but we now believe that um, these... Uh, nutritional environmental uh, triggers of autoimmunity in gen genetically susceptible individuals, they may represent uh, universal triggers. And so uh, clearly multiple sclerosis has been uh, a topic that uh, we've examined and I I've written or I've, I've made a couple of PowerPoint presentations and, and talked about that. The problem with multiple sclerosis is it depends on the tissue that's being attacked by the immune system. An autoimmune disease is a disease in which the immune system uh, it cannot distinguish the body's own tissue from foreign tissue, and it looks at the body's own tissues and it says, hey, this is foreign, we're going to mount an immune attack on it. And in the case of multiple sclerosis, there's coverings around the nerves that are attacked. And the problem with multiple sclerosis is that nerves grow, regrow very, very slowly. So if somebody has had MS for years and years and years, and they go on the paleo diet, they may not get worse, but it may be years uh, if, before they see improvements because nerve tissue grows so slowly. On the other hand, people that have GI tract immune uh, diseases like uh, ulcer, co ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, they respond within literally within days or weeks of adopting this diet, and uh, it, it seems to be very effective. Also, uh, other organs that uh, uh, can regenerate and can regenerate fast, <clears throat> rapidly uh, respond uh, to this uh, more more rapidly than. Uh, tissues that take a long time to heal. Yeah, on a, on a personal note, and I've, I've shared this already on a, uh, on a video I did a couple of weeks ago, I, I have uh, I've had, you know, gastric problems and, and take Nexium and all that stuff, and um, all that's gone. <laughs> in this yeah, that, I, there's, as I mentioned, you know, the, 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 when you get something right and it, it works, you know, it has a snowballing effect. So, if Lauren Cordain says, listen, if you've got an autoimmune disease and you try this diet and nothing happens, then people are going to say, look, I did it and it didn't work at all. But uh, I have uh, numerous uh, physician friends around the country that uh, are specialized in gastroenterology, and uh, they are increasingly becoming aware of the therapeutic effect of this diet for GI tract problems. Um, so even people without autoimmune disease with just generalized uh, malaise in the GI tract, uh, they seem to do quite well uh, within weeks or so of adopting it. Yeah, I go in for another endoscopy in a few months. I'll let you know what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> but personally, it seems to be fine. and I, I'm feeling really good. So I, the book, for someone who's not read the book yet, uh, you have uh, quite a few meal plans in there and uh, for different levels and also some uh, really delicious recipes yeah well my wife uh, wrote most of those recipes and uh, you know she and I have been doing this probably longer than anybody on the planet other than hunter gatherers so you got to make it practical and you got to make it workable and one of the, the things that I did is it's kind of like people who smoke cigarettes or abuse uh, alcohol or drugs or whatever um, I think there are certain kind of addictions and some people can go cold turkey and others can't and so when you talk about the diet and you say, hey, look, you can't ever eat any bread or grains or 
you know, cheese or whatever people like their, you know, their favorite processed foods, pizza and beer or whatever, um, I've got what we call the 85-15 rule. And uh, what that stands for is what you do 85% of the time is going to affect you, your health um, in a positive manner. And what you do 15% of the time um, probably won't hurt you that much and you'll probably see substantial health benefits. So what that means is over the course of a week, there's roughly 21 meals. And 85-15 means that 15% of those meals or three meals you can eat out. And so when people first adopt the diet, we give them that kind of levity. So, you know, if they have behavioral issues with changing the way they want to eat, they can always go back and do it. And one of the interesting things that I've heard, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times, is somebody says, man, I'm just craving that cup of coffee and donut for breakfast. And they go out and they do it, and they feel so awful, they go, oh, my God, I don't want that ever again. And they go back to having a half a cantaloupe and uh, you know, a piece of salmon, steak, or some beef or whatever, and they feel wonderful. They're energized uh, all throughout the morning. You know, they don't need to, to have the <clears throat> Danish or whatever to get them through the morning. Yeah, I, I think the only people that I have found that seem to have a bit of a, a hard time adjusting are the, I call them the carb kings and queens who who have lived on, you know, uh, processed carbs and, and really I don't think they even realize how much they eat of this stuff uh, between, you know, junk food bags of chips or whatever and, you know, the breads and the bagels and they seem to get into a little bit of a funk where they really have a, um, you know, the, I, one friend calls it the carb flu or something like that where he feels like he has the flu, but uh, he got through it after a, a Yeah, week. you know, I, th- one of the things that, that has really uh, caused the diet to take off, as I mentioned, you know, it's selling better now, you know, 10 years after it was released, close to 10 years than it was in 2002, is the, the CrossFit movement that's sweeping the country. There's this kind of uh, grassroots fitness movement that is, uh, uh, you know, mainly young people, but middle-aged people and older people as well. And they go out and they get themselves kind of a cheap, uh, broken-up building, and they put in a gym. And the gym is basically free weights and, you know, medicine balls and push-ups and pull-ups and all that with all, without all of the fancy uh, machines that you can go to in a, you know, their downtown gym and very inexpensive fees and so forth, and they uh, they emphasize high-intensity workouts uh, using a variety of different exercises. Um, and so it, it is, it's this huge grass fit or grassroots movement that's sweeping the country, and they've adopted the paleo diet as their de facto diet. And so, uh, you know, it works. It's kind of like their workout. It works as well. So it's... Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people now are doing it, and, and I think in part thanks to the CrossFit people, but also to uh, folks like uh, you've mentioned, the medical community. They, you know, this is a, a diet that if they can get over the, the grains and the dairy, um, it works. And I think most nutritionists don't have any problems when you tell them, hey, look, this is a diet that's based on fresh fruits, vegetables, as much as you can eat. Uh, a lot of seafood and lean meats, everybody's okay with that. But as soon as you say, oh, whole grains, they go, ooh. Or as soon as you say, no dairy, they go, hmm, we don't like that. So, But once again, I, I, we've written about it. We've written in the scientific and the nutritional literature uh, in peer review uh, scientific journals of what's wrong with those two food groups. And, you know, we stand on record as, as indeed these are nutritional lightweights and they have – potentially damaging effects as well. For, for people that are listening, too, um, when, I know some people worry about saturated fats in the, uh, in the meat. Uh, one, one thing that you talk about is, you know, there, there's beef and there's beef. Uh, for instance, I'm lucky where I live. Uh, literally five minutes from my house is a farm that uh, raises uh, grass-fed beef, and that's where I get mine. Um, and I, for years I've gotten all my... Uh, Almost all my fish, uh, salmon especially, I order it straight from Alaska and get it shipped to me. Now, people may think that that costs more money, and the truth of the matter is, with with the money that I'm saving on other junk foods, and I, I think this is actually a less expensive way of eating than uh, the normal American diet, where you're shopping expensive stuff in the middle of the uh, store. 
Yeah, I think I think you're you're absolutely right. Some of these processed foods are very expensive. You know, I don't know what a bag of M and M's or you know uh, a box of cereal for yeah, that. Or any, yeah, yeah, box of cereal. I have no idea what any of these things are going for these days. But uh, you know, real food is, is much better. And, and going back to the um, the issue of meat. Uh, you're absolutely right. If you can afford to get grass-fed, it's way better than grain-fed. And if you're, uh, you know, lucky enough to be a hunter, uh, you know, wild meat is is a little bit better still. We've published papers contrasting all three of them. In terms of the saturated fat issue, uh, you know, I think that if you are strictly paleo diet, I don't think that uh, uh, the amounts of saturated fat that you get in your diet are going to be a problem. So, uh, I, you know, I totally told people that uh, in, in <clears throat> actually we've re- re- revised the book uh, and that revision will be out in uh, December 13th and I've talked about the saturated fat issue in a lot of detail and so I think people can get the latest information but the bottom line is is that if, if you eat a pretty good you're 90% compliant with paleo um, saturated fat really isn't much of an issue I think that it's the inflammation that's way more important and so the the typical Western diet with grains and milk and dairy and processed foods high glycemic loads and low omega-3s tends to be a pro-inflammatory diet whereas the paleo diet is anti-inflammatory because it doesn't have grains doesn't have legumes doesn't have dairy doesn't have processed foods and is very high in omega-3 fatty acids Right. Well, this, uh, you mentioned you have a new book coming out. Don't you have a new cookbook too, or is that? Yeah, I got a new cookbook. The, we wrote the cookbook this summer, and so that'll also come out for the Christmas season. It's the Paleo Diet Cookbook and the revision to the 2002 book. Uh, so it will be the 2010 Paleo Diet. Both of those are coming out for the Christmas season, and then um, in the spring, I've got a, a fifth book coming out called the. Uh, uh, live in the paleo diet and it's a paleo diet lifestyle book that uh, gets into many of the issues that I didn't really have time for in either the cookbook or the first two books. Now, Ken, uh where do people if they want to buy the book can they pre-order it right now on Amazon? Uh, yeah, you can I think it, it's it's available as a pre-order on Amazon right now. So, uh you can get both the cookbook and the revised book at Amazon now. I think it'll be the springtime uh, when they'll start taking orders for the uh, the fifth book. Okay, well, fantastic. I, I could talk more about this, but I know we're running out of time, and uh, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, I, it's uh, it's really a great program. It's a great way of, of, of eating for life. It's not a diet. It's eating for life, people. So uh, Dr. Lauren Cordain. And thank you very much for being here today, sir. Well, thank you, Bob. It's my pleasure.